All right, thank you, everybody. Uh, and what I want to talk today about is uh, a method that we've developed um, to study fracture surfaces because we were running into some limitations of as we were looking at reactive flow and fractures uh, with uh, conventional X-ray CT, oh, excuse me, uh, with conventional X-ray uh, tomography uh, in both uh, time resolution and spatial resolution, uh, we wanted to develop and look at uh, interfaces so that we could study the kinetic kinetics of mineral dissolution um, and also maintain a, a high spatial resolution. And this, of course, while you know we're all here today to talk about uh, what's going on in, in fractures and fractured shale in particular, uh, but these fracture surfaces are, uh, I would argue, are incredibly important to mass transfer reactions. Uh, the roughness affects flow, uh, and so these things have a, these uh, processes uh, have obviously implications. Uh, with with all of these things, but typically in models, the, uh, the, the fracture surface is an ideal is treated as kind of the sharp ideal interfaces where they assume uh, a, a uniform uh, bulk properties end at a sharp interface, and assuming that these uh, fracture surfaces are static. I mean, of course, we've seen experimental results throughout the day uh, that that show that that's quite not the case. Um, and then they ob observe most of the observations, experimental observations, you're looking at freshly uh, cut or fractured uh, uh, fracture interfaces to, get, to derive these properties. And we have also, as I mentioned, done a lot of research related uh, into how reactive fluids alter these fracture surfaces. And so we're looking at the can see the original uh, fracture within the Amherstburg cap rock formation, and then this is the rock matrix. Uh, but by taking this subcore and, and doing high resolution X-ray CT, we can define uh, this fracture surface in terms of it's, it's th this fracture boundary region where you have this reactive front and then the original surface. And there have been significant changes, physical changes, within this fracture boundary. You have porosity changes, uh, the poor network structure changes, and the accessible surface area to minerals has also changed. And, and so what we want to, want to be able to do is how understand how uh, these changes affect things such as hydrocarbon diffusion, metal and radioactive uh, 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 element mobilization, and then also wettability within these, uh, within these zones, uh, again, the fracture surface. And as I mentioned, the, the fracture interface uh, has, it, the current uh, imaging capabilities are, uh, when you're looking at a large core, uh, we're limited in the uh, resolution, especially when you're trying to uh, collect uh, uh, multiple data sets uh, within a, a reasonable amount of period. Uh, and it's, in, it's critical to maintain the spatial, uh, uh, spatial, the ability to, to resolve things spatially because of the large variability of shale uh, mineralogy not only in the uh, bulk case, but here you see the Eagleford uh, thin section, and this is a, a, a thin section from the same rock that I'll be showing you experimental results from, that there is clear uh, spatial distribution. These are high carbonates, the Eaglefords, as many of you know, um, and you can see these, the red uh, calcite layers, but calcite is distributed throughout. Uh, so. In order to capture this, we developed this fracture surface flow-through flow cell where we use microfluidic uh, methods to build this. And you can see these layers go on and we're able to, to build up a, um, here is the, the, the final um, 
flow through cell and you can see this the size of the uh, flow through channel um, and what the this this flow through cell allows us to do is not only to control the flow rate and uh, uh, the delivery of acidic fluid fluids but this parallel plate design allows us to uh, control the thickness of of the rock sample which forms the back of this cell. Here is the window here and so we're going to be imaging uh, as a function of, of time and flow uh, in this w region right here which is the window. Um, and we do this at a, a synchrotron. It's, a, it's quite a simple uh, absorption or x-ray attenuation experiment um, at a classic tomography beam line, but we're able, what we're able to do is capture the in, uh, entire uh, size of this, uh, 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 this channel um, by using uh, three kilovolt, uh, three kilovolt uh, incident energy, and we're able to also maintain a high spatial resolution of, of a micron or less. Uh, and this large field, field of view where we take a mosaic of, of images uh, and to, to capture the whole thing. Uh, and we're able to do this during flow, which, which typically in the in situ methods you're, you're not able to do. So in this case, we're looking at primarily calcite dissolution. So uh, four images per hour uh, actually give us really good resolution. So here are the one way of looking a 2D map of the, the results. Uh, and we're looking at x-ray attenuation here. And so with, as you get to the, the hotter colors, that is uh, decreasing x-ray attenuation. And you can see after 23 and then 48 hours, uh, you have this reduction in x-ray attenuation, meaning that there's been uh, mineral dissolution and that we see this spatial uh, dissolution, uh, spatially uh, variable dissolution within the, within the rock. And so we want to look at what actually is going on so that we can then uh, go to calculate what the uh, actual dissolution rates are. Um, and so we're, we take the top off afterwards and uh, look at, do some micro XRF imaging of this channel and also look at x-ray tomography. Uh, so the x-ray tomography results, uh, a sample of them are shown here, where we take subcores of the channels. Uh, and so here you can see a top-down view looking at the unreacted surface. And here is the channel here. And what you see is that what's left behind is this kind of a, a, a porous network. Uh, so that where you can see here that the fracture surface actually it has been maintained, uh, and the reaction front you can see here uh, within the within the boundary. And what and what we've seen from gathering all this data is that the fracture boundary region has increased from a ma matrix porosity of four to six percent up to a forty to sixty percent. Uh, and then the ultimate goal of this this method is shown here uh, is that we're able to look at uh, calcite dissolution rate by uh, combining the information about how much calcite has been dissolved and how much of the silicate was left behind. Uh, and, um, and what we observe is over time that the uh, dissolution rate uh, slows with time as this uh, porous network develops. Uh, we also, uh, this spatial variation uh, is um, uh, related to a complex combination of both flow and mineral distribution. And then looking at the XRF images, we're, we're a little uh, confused at first, um, where we see a cal calcium uh, signal that looked like we were originally thinking that we had some sort of eddies and we were seeing precipitation. But once we uh, found, had the XCT uh, details, uh, we were able to uh, see that the, the this calcium signal is coming from these high points or 
where there's been less reaction of the, the uh, calcite. Uh, what we also learned from the micro XRF map is that the accessible surface area, so the minerals that are open to either adsorption of gas or water, uh, so the wettability will be controlled no longer by, dominated by calcite, but now dominated by iron sulfides, uh, sulfides and, and clay, clay minerals, as we were able to uh, infer from the uh, iron and other uh, elements within, within this map. Uh, so in summary, um, we, we saw with this method that this sharp interface uh, was transformed into this por highly porous boundary region. Um, the fracture surface does, does not recede as the calcite uh, dissolves, but instead leaves behind uh, a network. Uh, and we see a, a, a slowing of the, the dissolution rate uh, as that front proceeds. Um, this Reaction, reaction front developed a, a really complex, complex topography uh, where we see kind of a, a channelization within this boundary region uh, and accessible mineral surface area that's dominated by sulfides and clays. Uh, I hope I can leave you today with the, the, the uh, idea that we need to look into more details of what is going on and how these surf surfaces of fractures uh, evolve over time under reactive flow. Uh, I do, do believe that there are some, some uh, promising trends and technologies that will allow us to take this type of experiment into uh, a, one of the kind of a classic core, core study, fractured core study, uh, where we can include confining pressure as this would surely affect the development and stability of, of this uh, porous boundary region. So with that, uh, thank you, and I'll take any questions. Well, it, it, it will affect how water is imbibed into the, into the, the rock itself, uh, which is going to be a complex relationship on, of how the wettability changes as you go from calcite to silica. Um, so it would be interesting to see, based on your, some of your calculations, whether these effects of uh, changes in the surface, surfaces will be significant uh, relative to the fracture spacing, which is the, the number that you're, that you're playing with. Um, I would think that most of what we're looking at, the changes, are happening over, uh, you know, a, a matter of days. Uh, so this is, this is something that, that would happen right at the, you know, affect kind of the beginning of, the, of production. Scale bar. So, what's the physical distance of this surface arc, uh, reaction front? Yeah, that from uh, the surface. We were seeing any, anywhere uh, from you know tens of microns to a hundred microns of the, the that boundary region. Yeah, from the earlier. Any questions? Slides. Yeah. This was a, a, a simple HCl, uh, you know, medium ionic strength solution.